Iraq and Afghanistan. Soldiers call it the sand pit, but it ain't no game. British and American forces are fighting their fiercest contacts since World War II. In this series, I'll be telling the hero stories, acts of courage and bravery that are mostly unknown until now. In this episode, I'm looking at close combat as our lads go toe to toe with the enemy. We'd killed quite a few people. Not only that, but these people are sometimes within 10, 12 feet of you. And we'll be meeting the US infantryman who took out insurgents with his bare hands. I chose to go back and, and kill those guys one by one. It doesn't get tougher than this. I'm Andy McNabb, and this is my tour of duty. Any tour of duty is a challenge. In 1991, I led a covert SAS mission behind Iraqi lines. When we were compromised, I went face to face with the enemy. I learned some tough lessons. Lessons like how to survive when the bad guys are right on top of you. In 2004, a small British patrol got caught up in the ultimate face-off. Nine squaddies against 100 insurgents in a fight to the death. How many more of them is it going to take to get through this back door and into the building? In the soldiers' own words, used incredible unseen footage from the front line and their own detailed reconstructions, this is the story of one Royal Horse Artillery in Basra. <laughs> In 2004, one RHA deployed to Basra, Iraq for what they believed would be a hearts and minds tour. It wasn't a combat mission. We weren't there to uh, hunt and uh, find insurgents, far from it. We were there on a, um, a part of the rebuilding of, of Iraq. This is your country and we don't want to take it, we want to give it back to you. Back then we could walk quite freely down the streets uh, of Basra and we did so on a daily basis. There wasn't that palpable sense of, um, of danger that perhaps you get now when you go to Iraq. But in August of 2004, relations between militant cleric Muqtada al-Sada and the coalition forces hit rock bottom. US troops surrounded the second holiest site in Iraq, and al-Sada called his Mahdi army to rise up against them. In Basra, the militia took action and surrounded Camp Stephen, a satellite base holding a small detachment of Marines and guarded by soldiers of the Iraqi army. The Iraqi army who were based in that camp were on the verge of capitulating to the militia outside. In quick response, one Royal Horse Artillery tasked the patrol. Their job was to provide fire support from two vehicles as the troops stranded in Camp Stephen extracted past the militia and to safety. As we left camp, it was, it was obvious that something was, was not right with the day. 50, 60 metres apart, um, convoy distance sort of thing, and then just talking to each other, on the, you know, I mean, obviously watch your hearts, look after people, things like that, how quiet it was. The streets were bare, something wasn't right, and it was evident that something was going to happen. The absence of normal activity, no one around, is a combat indicator. A good sign that troubles around the corner. But when there's lads in grave danger, what choice have you got but to keep on moving? You're on a task. You're trying to save other soldiers' lives. In the middle of the road, there was a big barrier. It must have been about two foot high. And I knew there was a gap in that barrier where we was going to turn around and then wait for the call sign to extract. It's only when I got within a few feet of that gap in the road that I realised that it was blocked. That's when we got contacted. We had like things hitting the side of the vehicle, it sounded like stones. It was like flicking on a switch, it was like a hailstorm, like you're driving up the motorway and you come across a freak hailstorm. Only it wasn't hail, it was bullets. I saw the, the flame of an RPG basically and the smoke trail around it comes straight, straight at us. There was militia all over the streets, running in and out of buildings. 
It was on tops of houses. There was fire from shop windows. So there was everywhere. There was just swarms of people all over the place. Contact! Contact! I got on the, the radio to talk back to the ops room, but the explosion had blew the tuning unit on the front out. We've lost comms with the ops room. They don't know what's happening. It's like, right, we're on the zone here. With comms down, it's always a big drama. I've been in that situation, and you cannot call in air support. You cannot call in any backup. It's just you and the weapons you've got in your hand. In an ambush, there's only two choices. Back the way you came, or straight into a wall of lead. We drove something like two kilometers, uh, constantly under this heavy hailstorm of bullets and RPGs. Then we hit an ID. And from that point then, the vehicle was just limping along on three wheels. Terry and the lads got no choice but to abort their mission. Now they need to focus on getting themselves to safety. The only thing to do was to, was to drive out of the killing zone. The patrol head for the Bath Party headquarters. Staffed by friendly Iraqi forces, it's their best chance for some cover. But the militia have beat them to it. We got to the gate only to be greeted by another hail of bullets. We were engaging her from, from two or three different directions. We were very much surrounded. We couldn't reverse out because we were just reversing back into it. We couldn't go forward. But we knew we had no communications back to base. We knew our vehicles weren't going to last very much longer. And we knew we had to get ourselves to safety. It was just how we were going to go about doing all that. Still to come, battle stations in Basra. Things go from bad to worse. I didn't really want to kill somebody. I just wanted them to go away but they was wanting to come and fight that day. Ambushed and seriously outnumbered on the streets of Basra. Nine men of the Royal Horse Artillery are trying to get their vehicles out of the line of fire before it's too late. At this point now, we'd been in contact for, for about 10, 15 minutes or so. I suppose it's one of the hardest choices I had to make was we're, we're going to have to leave the vehicles. And the guys did just burst out. And as they burst out, they, they were on the floor uh, straight away, laying down fire. Don't shoot! I remember Ollie being the first one to engage one of the enemy. The guy pulled up an RPG and was aiming it towards us. Basically, it was all the remorse. So basically, I took the opportunity, hit him. And that's when it, it rang it home to a lot of people that, that you are actually going to have to t return fire and kill these people in order for us to, to survive, basically. The lads were now relying on their training and their SA-80 A2 assault rifles. A standard issue weapon for most British troops. It packs a punch. Want to know more? It's time for McNabb's basic training. The SA-80 is an unusual bit of kit. Designed on the ballpark principle, the barrel of the weapon goes right the way back into the stock. The result, a short weapon you can fire from a vehicle and is excellent for close quarter battle. 
And on top of that, the sight is far superior than any Western Army's got. So it's a good weapon. My only personal experience of, of being with troops in, in Basra, um, you know, I know, I know a, a, an 18-year-old rifleman, for the very first time he went on the streets, he fired six rounds in close-up in, environment, and he got three kills. All three targets were less than 50 metres away from him. So the snap shooting capability is fantastic. When it was first introduced in 1985, soldiers hated it. It kept jamming, bits broke. But in 2000, it was redesigned and reborn with the kinks ironed out. As you can see, it's an excellent rate of fire. And even when you're firing in fully automatic, the, the recoil is really good. It's nice and smooth, so you can get good, accurate rounds down on the target. It's a really good bit of kit. Ambushed and taking heavy enemy fire, Terry Bryan and the lads only option is to leave their vehicles, safety catches off and put their SA-80s into action. At this point, uh, things were going through my head at 100 miles an hour again. You knew if you sat still that they would be on you within seconds. I suppose it was one of the hardest choices I had to make was we're, we're going to have to leave the vehicles because it, if we stay with the vehicles, they know where to come and get us. Only decision was to leave the vehicles and go on foot. You just go from there. One thing you're guaranteed when you're fighting in an urban environment is plenty of cover. But that's not good enough. And what you need is cover from fire. That's something solid between you and the enemy. So we extracted out the area, up the only way that was left available, really, up a, up a street, narrow street. It was like the corner of the building, I don't know, 50 odd metres away. We just set the goal of getting behind that wall. It was so intense, it was so fast and it was so fluid. There were still bullets flicking up by your feet as you're running along. It's 1-0 to Osada's militia. As the lads take cover, a local cameraman shoots this incredible footage of the insurgents taking out their frustration on the abandoned Land Rovers. With both vehicles destroyed, the militia turn their attentions back to the men who escaped. Terry and the lads become the focus of a deadly manhunt. Basically, we could hear the insurgents, they'd lost us. And they were just saying, look, be quiet, be quiet. They've looked, we could hear them running up and down the streets, running me flat, firing into where they thought it were. The lads desperately need backup, and that means contacting base. But none of their radios survived the ambush. Terry's mobile phone is their last hope. Thank God we had the phone. That was the only means of communications we had. So when I rang the ops room initially, you know, Derek, they saw my number flash up on the screen. Oh, hello, how are you? You know, I'm, I'm fucking in the shit here, basically. And they're like taking her back straight away. They were under the impression that everything was going on really well because we were still within the time scale of things. And it all came out like 100 miles an hour. If you were trying to, um... Uh, create a scenario which um, you know was worst case a nightmare scenario then that would be it you know, nine guys on foot lightly armed um, hundreds of insurgents and isolated from uh, friendly forces by some considerable distance uh, 
I had absolutely no doubt that some of those soldiers uh, who were out, out on foot in the deep into Basra would, uh, would be killed. With half of Basra hunting them down, the lads' only chance of survival is to get something solid between them and the enemy. I'd picked out a house that, that we were going to occupy and set up a defensive position. Then we, we came across, uh, across another wave, really, of incoming fire. They'd obviously pinpointed where we were. They'd had time to come round, maybe flank us from a different direction. But we could have potentially been going into a, another trap. So I picked two guys and I asked them to clear the house. But as the lads are checking every room is clear, the insurgents give them a nasty surprise. Suddenly so shouted grenade, a grenade comes right past, like, over his shoulder sort of thing, sort of rolled to the back of the room. The insurgent or whatever who had chucked it through the window thought, yeah, got him, sort of mine his underwear. It's up to one of the lads to let them know They've picked a fight with a wrong patrol. And then he shouted, room clear, and the house was clear. Go, go! Go, go, go! Terry and his patrol got into a house. They had a solid wall now between them and the enemy. But now there's nowhere to run. They've got to stand their ground. Well, then it, was, it just came in wave after wave of incoming fire. Very loud, obviously inside of an house, it's all enclosed in machine gun fire. They're obviously firing RPGs still at us, machine gun fire grenades. And it became very evident then that it was a very well planned operation that they'd done. They'd used the, uh, the mob outside the base earlier on as the bait. You know, we went out, we took the bait and they attacked us. There was a lot of people uh, milling around, obviously heard what was going off, got transport whatever, jumped on the bandwagon basically and was coming down uh, to have a go at the Brits. Took the time then to phone the ops room again, just let them know what we'd done, where we were. Back in the ops room at base, Major Paul Bates is trying to put together an accurate picture of the soldier's situation. We were having conversations and myself and the ops officer offline of a of mobile phone about how serious you know, the situation was. But you know, the guys were holding up well. They were at a single location, um, they made an assessment it will be defendable, but nevertheless, you know, they were now going to be in a, a 360 degree battle. It wasn't going to be easy for them, far from it. As patrol commander, Terry Bryan's decisions could now mean life or death for him and eight other men. A far cry from his ambitions on the day he joined up. The reason I joined the army in the first place was uh, I want to be a chef. There's only when I got the careers office that I was pointing in a different direction uh, and I joined the artillery. Prior to deploying to Iraq, I felt quite nervous initially because I was in charge of about 30, a troop of 30 guys. A wide spectrum of people. I had some guys in there that had loads and loads of experience and they were really very well trained and I had some really, really young guys that were very inexperienced and not long been out of training. But there was a very close, tight-knit bond between us all so we all knew what we were doing. And that day we were sent out on a task to help our colleagues and we ended up under siege in a house fighting for our lives. With the house under attack from every side, a massive battle is raging downstairs. Two of the youngest members of the patrol are fighting for their lives as the militia try to get in through the front and rear doors. The guys at the bottom, they're pretty busy with their own little battles they've got themselves. Frank Command was at the back, covering the back of the house by the kitchen. And there was only within a few feet of Frank, they'd come in through the back door. He'd shoot one down, his mucker would be behind him, pick up his weapon, take his place. Frank would shoot him down, his mucker would come up behind, pick up his weapon, carry on, and it would go on like that. Street fighting, killing the enemy really close up, just metres away from you, 
ain't like the films. It's traumatic. You can see the enemy's face as they're getting dropped. You can see the strike marks as your rounds enter their bodies. But you know, you just got to keep on doing it. Because if you don't, you're the one who's getting dropped. Gunner Dan Cavidi was given the task of covering the front of the house. The first person that I uh, uh, killed, when I shot him, I, I just um, told Frank without looking at him, Frank, I got one, I got one. And it's just like, um, it's like we were playing games again. They were just uh, running towards you, trying, uh, I mean, firing at you at the same time. They were trying to open the door to come in. Having never fired a shot in anger, Gunnar Kavidi now had to kill if he wanted to see his wife and children again. You can still see the, the, the fear or, well, the, the, their anger or something when they, when they fired at me. I was a bit scared there, though. The first time I, uh, during a contact, the picture that came into my mind was my uh, uh, son. He's uh, just turned one when I left. I was praying, telling God if, if, he, if he's got his um, angel or something just to uh, protect me from, from the worst. Insurgent bodies are piling up outside the house, but the militia aren't giving up. The battle is just beginning. It makes it scary knowing the fact that they're willing to give their lives for that. And how many more of them are going to do the same? How many more of them is it going to take for them to get through this, to this back door and into the building? I decided that we needed to get outside in order to be able to hear what was going off and to, to have a bit of a better perspective. And I looked over the wall, I could see a mass of people gathering around. Potentially they were gonna storm the building. And as I stuck my head around, I just got at the corner of my eye, I noticed one of the insurgents in the building opposite. It was already probably aimed up on this little gap in the wall that my head was sticking around. And he just opened up on me. Bullet hit in the wall, there was loads of fragments of uh, brick, brick dust that went all in my eye. And I stood up, I don't know why, I just stood up and got the dust out of my eye. I noticed out of my good eye a grenade. Grenade! And then I felt this sharp stinging pain in my leg and I realised, I looked down, I realised I'd been hit in my leg by the grenade and my arm, I looked over and I could see blood coming out of my arm and out the top of my thigh. And the blast hit Ryan James, who was the, the medic. Ryan! Ryan, you okay? And uh, he went, oh, I've been hit, and that's all, and me and Terry at the same time, so that's all we need, the fucking medic being took out straight away. Ryan, I said, Ryan, are you okay? And he, he, he looked up like gasping for air, as if he was winded. Yeah, yeah, I'm fine, he got his breath, you know. This is great, I said, that's great. I said, now get up, you lazy bastard, and fucking work. <laughs> I looked down and, and quickly assessed my own injuries, and they, I could still move around. Uh, I didn't feel any pain after the initial kick, but there was always a thought in the back of my mind that this is very serious, and if I've been injured, then maybe other people can also be injured. Coming up in part three. <laughs> The lads of 1RHA decide that if help doesn't come soon, they might have to make the ultimate sacrifice. But obviously they're going to make an example of catching British soldiers. I didn't want to be tortured. We just counted uh, enough rounds out. It's weird, like a bit of a calm comes over you. You think, yeah, this is it really. And one US Marine caught up in a fight in Iraq in 2004 goes eyeball to eyeball with an insurgent who won't back down. I was pushing that eyeball back and I, I lost the nerve. I wanted to just stick my finger all the way through and it just freaked me out. It was like a water chestnut.
I'm Andy McNabb. In 1991, I led a team of elite SAS soldiers behind enemy lines in Iraq. 15 years on, British and American soldiers are back in the Middle East. In this episode, I'm looking at what happens when the lads come face to face with the enemy. Later on, we'll meet the US soldier who battled insurgents with his bare hands. I opened up my vest and I had the sappy plate and I just was hammering him with it, just hammering him with it. Uh, and, and just taking his hair and ramming it into my, my plate and he would not relent. But first, in 2004, one Royal Horse Artillery tasked a patrol of nine men with a rescue mission in Basra. They were ambushed and forced to abandon their vehicles. A local cameraman shot this incredible footage of the Mardi militia destroying their snatch land routes. These pictures show exactly what the nine British lads were up against. It was clear, if they were going to get out in one piece, they had the fight of their lives ahead of them. Go, go! Go, go, go! The lads took cover in a nearby house, but were soon surrounded by the Mardi army. Close quarters fighting, no prisoners. For the nine men of the Royal Horse Artillery, it weren't their day. They were stuck in a house in central Basra, and half of the city were there trying to drag them out. I was very surprised that we'd not already had a casualty uh, and I was looking around constantly counting the guys making sure I still had them all along with me uh, and it was in the back of my mind all, all the time that if one of them does become a casualty that we're going to have to carry him or we're going to have to treat him where we're going to take him to and all this time we're still coming under contact. It was just so close, it was so unreal. God knows why they were missing. The only thing keeping the 100 strong militia at bay is a supply of ammo that won't last forever. And the militia know it. Time was going on, ammunition was dwindling away, and no one yet was out to come and get us. The key concern for us was that um, as the contact went on and it seemed like it had been going on for an eternity, um, was purely the, you know, running out of ammunition. You know, there, will, there will come a stage where the only thing that is left is uh, you know, nine bayonets um, and, and that's it. Fixing bayonets hasn't always been the role of the Royal Horse Artillery. Terry and the men in his patrol belong to a regiment dating back to Waterloo. One RHA were the big guns who fired the first artillery shells of World War I. But back then, they operated behind their own lines and never saw the enemy. Now, in the 21st century, every soldier in every regiment needs to be trained in all kinds of combat and should be prepared to meet the enemy face to face. The noise shouting, obviously, they're all getting very excited by this time because obviously trying to get us out of the house and things like that. Things are probably becoming a bit too much. The intensity of the fighting, uh, the pressure and everything just gets up on you. You've got so much to think about. There's a lot of mental stress, obviously thinking you've got to think one step ahead, what they're going to do. Terry and Matt are taking it in turns to relay their position to base via a mobile phone. But before a quick reaction force can be deployed into the danger zone to get them, the commanders need to pinpoint their exact location. The critical thing for us was, you know, where is that house? And, and rather than running around the streets, we've, we, we can now try and determine where that house is to make an extraction from. Um, but convert it at the back of your mind, there's always, is this the last stand of, of those soldiers? For the lads in the house, the pressure of constant combat is starting to take its toll. We kept asking for the seat for the grid, grid, send the grid, put chuck more smoke out like this, and we're thinking, God, it's the Bath Party Hotel, everybody knows where it is. 
I think I honestly thought that they were trying to humour us, saying, yeah, we're sending somebody when there was no intention or they couldn't get down. And I think I got to that point where thinking, I think they're humouring us here. Not long after I had that thought, I did speak to Terry, and I said, look, this is looking good. And, you know, I sat down with Ollie and we had a conversation about, God, if this is the end, what we're going to do. Bearing in mind, we only had nine people on the patrol, nine people defending this, this house, and there was, by now, 50, 60, maybe 70 people. At, at some point, there was over 100 people outside the house, and if that sort of number of people was to swarm it, then they, then they would have taken it. And we had all sorts of ideas running through our heads. They wouldn't kill us, they would probably just drag us off and torture us and make some display of us. We obviously know that surrender isn't even an option for these people. The worst scenario is it could be anything. Obviously, it's going to result in some sort of death, but how long that death would take or, or whatever. But obviously, they're going to make an example of catching British soldiers uh, on, the, on the newsreels and the internet and everything else. I didn't want to be tortured. I'd rather go down fighting or take it myself, you know, do it myself. Suicide, it's unthinkable, unless you're about to be overrun and ripped apart. I think we both looked at each other and sort of come to the same conclusion, really. We just counted uh, enough rounds out. It was a very quick, frank conversation that if push comes to shove and, and we do get swarmed, that we'd do the lights and then we'd, we'd do each other if need be. It's weird, like a bit of a calm comes over you. You think, yeah, this is it, really. Like every man in the building, Max Fortz turned to his loved ones at home. I thought, uh, oh, oh, Bell and then Cole, that's me, me uh, your fiance and my son, thinking, yeah, the life insurance, silly things, yeah, the life insurance is all right, yeah, they were all right. And that was it, really, for me, yeah, that's it then. Worst day of my life? I can think of some things that's been the worst day of my life. But no, I wouldn't say the worst day of my life. Something I'm, I'm, I'm I, was glad, I was glad to be a part of. So it's, part of it's part of history now, part of battery history, regimental history, and something I'm glad to say I was a part of it. Didn't really do well at school, no real GCSEs, well, none really. No real prospects coming up at the time, nothing much happening around, so I thought, yeah, the army's for me. I'm going to make a career of it, I've got just under four years left uh, to get me 22. Soldiers know that if they get captured in Iraq or Afghanistan, death is probably the better option. If you're contemplating killing your mate, the rest of your patrol, and then yourself, you know things are as bad as they are ever going to get. So what they decided to do was take it into their own hands. They wanted control. Matt and the lads of 1RHA are facing their worst nightmare. Their lives are in the balance. They've proved they can hold the enemy off, but will the rescue force arrive before it's too late? Kinetic face-to-face -face action is a daily reality for coalition troops in Iraq. In 2004, the US infantry found themselves engaging in some of their bloodiest battles ever, fighting an insurgent force for the city of Fallujah. This incredible footage shows Staff Sergeant David Bellavia in action with his squad. The civilian population left the city of 350,000 was basically a ghost town with about four to, to 5,000 insurgents in there. Get ready, go! We were hunting them, and then day two, they were hunting us. They were ready to kill Americans and die in jihad. On a day that should have been a celebration, Bellavere was tasked with leading his squad on a mission to flush insurgents out of hiding. My 29th birthday, uh, we basically got the call to take out a city block with six to eight bad guys. Our guys walk in, kick down the door, go in. 30 homes, nothing. Finally, in the very one of the second last houses, we kick in the door. 
and they just opened up on us with belt-fed machine guns. Bellavere and his men walked into an ambush and took instant casualties. In an ambush, things go wrong. War ain't a science. The number one priority is to get yourself out of that killing area. But Bellavere decided to do the exact opposite. Like a light switch, it went off. I, I felt that this was a, a spiritual battle for me. I, I want to be John Wayne. That's who I am. That's what I'm all about. You know what? I took a machine gun and, man, I, those 200 rounds went so quick. You know, you, I wanted it to just kind of last a while to suppress them. Our guys got out. I ended up literally looking down the barrel of just rounds coming right at my face. Bellavia was engaging enemy fighters throughout the house. Going close quarters with his M4, he was hitting targets, but the insurgents kept coming. The reason? Most of them are high on stimulants. They used atropine and epinephrine. I'm hitting them over and over and over again, and these guys are just coming after me like zombies. I hit a guy in the chest, I hit a guy in center mass, I had to hit the, the pelvis to get them to stop running. I had to hit bone, I had to hit face shots. I had to hit them in the heart repeatedly to stop them going. I got an alcove of a wall protecting me and I can hear like the, the scuffle of feet a uh, windbreaker pants, and they're literally just creeping, 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 and they start whispering to me. They call me a Jew, said that they're gonna cut my head off, and that my mommy's not gonna find my dog tags, um, that they'll never find my body. I mean, the, the fear is just unbelievable. The insurgents moved up to the next level of the house, and Bellavia decided to stay hot on their heels. We exchanged fire on the landing, and uh, he ran into a room. I hit him in the head of the grenade, and it goes off to the side and blows off into a bunch of mattresses. With no more ammunition, Bellavere realized he now had to fight for his life with his bare hands. He's got a chunk of his arm missing, and I just went after him like a baseball player, and we're just nailing each other, you know, blow to blow. He hit me with an AK-47. My dad's a dentist, I get knocked in the teeth and knock out a tooth and I'm thinking, my dad's gonna kill me. You know what I mean? Like the irrational thoughts that come into your mind during this moment. We're rolling on the ground. I'm literally subduing him with my helmet. It's the only thing I had, my helmet, just beating him in the face with a helmet. And a 45 pistol just goes off. And I'm like, he's got that pistol, I'm done. I gotta get to my rifle, gotta get to his AK, something. I, I opened up my vest, and I had the sappy plate, and I just was hammering him with it, just hammering him with it, and he would not relent. At one point, I had my finger in his eye, and I could feel I was pushing that eyeball back, and I really thought the eyeball was a ball. It was just a little sack of fluid, and I, I lost the nerve. I, I mean, I wanted to just stick my finger all the way through, and I couldn't do it. And this eye, his eye collapsed. It just freaked me out. It was like a water chestnut. I stood up. He put his head right in my genitals and just crunched down. And every synapse just fired. I, I tried to, to break his collarbone with my fists just to beat him down. And he was still locked onto me. And at that point, I realized I had a knife. And that, that knife is the only thing that was going to make me live. I think every soldier thinks about the very first time he's going to have to kill someone. I know I certainly did. But when those situations kick off, all you're thinking about is making sure you're not the one that gets dropped. And it's as simple as that. And, and the blade went in, hit his collarbone, cut me. And then the second time, I just felt the warmth, just a pressure of warmth come out. As he was bleeding out, he caressed my face and he and he gave me a smile and 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 he and he basically said I just said stop stop. 
And he said, no. And he smiled. And I, for a long time, I thought he was like forgiving me for what I had to do. And maybe I, he was thanking me for bringing him to paradise or whatever that. But it was, uh, it was creepy. His eyes went dim. They locked right onto me. Belavere was awarded the silver and bronze stars and recommended for the Medal of Honor for his actions in Iraq. But for him, life will never be the same. There's no innocence anymore, you know what I mean? You're, you're, you know, every time you hear about a death in Iraq, you know what it looks like, you know what it smells like. For the rest of my life, I was going to see that, that stupid son of a bitch's face looking at me for the rest of my life, and I was going to be haunted by that. I've had better birthdays for sure, you know? Coming up in part four, the British patrol in Basra fight for their lives, but time is running out. Then thoughts start creeping in your What if they get in the house? What if they capture us? So Sergeant Terry Bryan takes the biggest gamble of his life. I ran into the middle of the street, surrounded by all this militia. For nine British soldiers under siege in Basra, time is running out. Surrounded by hundreds of insurgents and low on ammo, every shot they fire has to count. We've killed quite a few people and it was coming naturally. Not only that, but these people were very close to you. Although the militia bodies are stacking up, the British soldiers are now running dangerously low on ammunition. I didn't really want to kill somebody, I just want them to go away. But they was wanting to come and fight that day. Then them thoughts start creeping in your head. What if they get in the house? What if they capture us? What the lads don't know is that a rescue mission is now underway. One Princess of Wales' Royal Regiment have deployed 12 warriors from the Shat El Arab base. They're six k's away from Terry's position and have got to fight their way through the streets to find the house. There was some real intense fighting taking place in the house Owen Brian was. And there was equally intense fighting taking place from B Company who were um, going balls out uh, to go and save their mates who were in deep shit. Then the lads hear the distinctive sound of heavy armour close by. But it was a built up area and I knew it was going to be difficult to try and find us. So at this point I got out on the balcony again and then I saw the warrior. Desperate times called for desperate measures. Terry had a choice. Stick around and die, or break cover and live. You're dead anyway, anything you do is gonna be a bonus. Simple as that. Straight away I decided to do it, just to go out and run. So Brian knew that he's got to get out there and physically make eye contact with the warriors. I ran into the middle of the street, surrounded by all this militia, who were just quite shocked probably to see me. And just waved at the warrior as furiously as I could. 
it was evident of what, what we'd done. There was bodies lying on the floor that we'd hit. And the warrior saw me, and all this time there were still bullets coming in, but they were just flicking up around your feet. I then about turned and ran back in the building as fast as I could, take cover. I told everyone, the warriors here, they've come to get us out, we're going home. And they didn't want to leave initially, it sounds strange, but because it was comfortable in that house and it had protection, it was hard to try and say, look, lads, we're going, we're going home. I remember Frank saying that he'd, he'd seen someone tampering around with the door, so he didn't know if it was booby trapped or anything. Terry had survived the contact lasting nearly three hours and a suicidal run into the enemy position. If he makes it through this door, he and the lads are home and dry. I got the medic and I said, right, I'm going to go through this door. Uh, if it goes off, just drag me to the warrior and we'll sort it out when we get back in. But I kicked the door and nothing happened. <laughs> They'd rammed vehicles in the back alley to try and block us in because they really didn't want us to leave that building. Uh, it felt really good to get in the back of the Warrior. Unbelievable, really. And you realise how lucky you've been in, and how you've got away with your life, basically. Against the odds, every man in the one RHA patrol survived the contact. But the regiment sent to help them weren't so fortunate. They were uh, incredibly hard fighting. The company commander was injured earlier on, the company sergeant major, and ultimately um, Private Leo Callahan from uh, B Company was killed during that extraction operation. Everyone reacts differently to a major contact, but there's no denying every soldier is glad to put his training into practice, to do their job and prove themselves. But it ain't a normal day's work. When they came out of the back of the Warrior, they were uh, like they'd been on drugs. It's just an incredible exhibition of human emotion. Like many soldiers who see kinetic action, Dan Cavidi found himself having flashbacks to that day. Sometimes during the day when I'm working, I can still see these militias wearing balclava and in black. I have to grab all my mates. Can you see this guy uh, coming towards you? He's firing at us but then there's nobody there. It's just the uh, imagination. I do think about it occasionally, and certainly it reminders, you know, when you watch the news of things that go off out there, when you see that there's been another soldier die, uh, it certainly hits home as to how close you were to, to losing your own life. I'm not a religious man, but I think the big man up there was watching down us that day. Um, just probably wasn't, just not our time to go. For his incredible leadership and courage during active service operations, Terry Bryant was awarded one of the highest medals in the British Army. I was awarded the Conspicuous Gallantry Cross by the Queen for my actions in Iraq and Operation Talik 4. And I wear the award on behalf of everybody in the patrol that day because at the end of the day it was a team that went out there and it was a team that came back in and we all had our part to play. Muqtada al Saad has now issued a statement through one of his aides. It says that the uprising will continue unless the coalition withdraws its troops from Iraq's towns and cities. Next time on Tour of Duty, we'll be looking at the threat British and American troops face from enemy ambushes. Outnumbered, outgunned and surrounded on all sides, it's a fight to the death. We were heading for the high ground and the whole world opened up around us, and I, and I was pinned down, I couldn't, I couldn't move. Hey!